Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to finish this chapter uh, this morning. We are in a series called In Christ. We are in week 13 of our Ephesians series. And it doesn't seem like 13 weeks, uh, but we are in week 13 of our series. And, um, and so we, will, we're not, we are about halfway through, six chapters in Ephesians, and we are on chapter 3. I'll be honest with you. Um, Sometimes, I, I've only been pastoring for over a year, so let me just say I qualify it with that. I fear sometimes for me, if we start in a large book of the Bible, that after a f- several weeks or a few months, I'm going to be like, okay, like we need to pause, go to something else, and maybe come back. Me personally, in my study, I don't feel that way at all about Ephesians. Even being in it for 13 weeks, which is three solid months, I don't feel that way at all about the book of, the Ephes- of, of Ephesians. I'm going to continue through it. But just so you guys are aware, I am aware of that. If, we ever, if you ever hear me say, hey, we're going to take on you know, the gospel of whatever, and you're like, oh, that's like 40-some chapters, you know, like, I won't do that to you, like, I'll make sure we piece it together um, other ways, because I have ADD, and so I can't handle but so much of the same thing, so, we are in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, in this passage, has a prayer that he prays for the people, and that's the title of today's message, the prayer for the people. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. If you have your Bible or access to like a Bible app or something like that, feel free to follow along in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Completely fine. We will have the verses on the screen for you to follow along with. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. The Bible says this. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God." Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. There's my music reference. Isn't that Randy Travis? Is that Randy Travis? I'm going to love. Okay, I'm I'm, going to be good. If this is your first time today, welcome. I apologize. I will throw a music thing in there pretty much every week, maybe a movie um, reference, and that's just how my fleshly mind works every now and then, and I apologize. If you don't like that song, then sorry. All right, but um, I appreciate this passage of Scripture. I appreciate Paul. Um, I appreciate this specific portion of this letter that he is writing to the Christians at Ephesus. He finishes this segment. Remember, we have learned that Ephesians is is split right down the middle. The first three chapters, theological, about who we are in Christ. Last three chapters, practical, about how we are to behave because we are in Christ. So we're about to get there. I can't wait for next Sunday, by the way. It's going to be good. If you want to start reading Ephesians 4, not right now, but later this week, start reading Ephesians 4. You'll see where we're going next week. I'm excited about that. But he ends this portion of the, the letter with this prayer. In chapter 1, we actually preached a sermon entitled, I Hope You Get It. And that was his first prayer. Uh, Just that, I hope you understand. And he had just gone through some things about the Holy Spirit. He had just gone through some very important theological truths. And now he prays another prayer that's similar to, I hope you get it. This time he focuses on the themes that we have been discussing and uh, throughout these first three uh, chapters. If you want to notice, if you want to see where we know that this is kind of a breaking point in the book, I mean, look at the way he ends this chapter. He ends it with the word amen, uh, which is oftentimes a, a, a finish to begin something else. Um, and so he kind of lets us know here that this first portion of the letter is done and the second portion is Soon coming. I don't know this to be true, but I can imagine, you know, maybe uh, what this is, I always qualify this as Joshology, but maybe as he was finishing up this portion of the letter, there was somebody that could maybe deliver this portion of the letter and basically saying, hey, I'm about to give you some more stuff the next time he comes through. Just think of it that way uh, as, a, as a two part uh, letter that he is sending. And after giving us many deep theological truths to consider in these first three chapters, he is going to pray over these 
churches, these local churches in the town of Ephesus. And we're going to learn from that this morning. Heavenly Father, would you lead us and guide us? Holy Spirit of God, would you illuminate Scripture to us? God, would you let us comprehend things that maybe we have not comprehended before? May you remind us of things that you have taught us in times past that maybe we have not paid attention to and not really given full credence to. God, if there's someone here today who has never made you their Lord and Savior, God, they've never entered into a personal relationship with Jesus. I pray that today would be that day. We love you and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Very quickly this morning, we're going to jump right in. Number one, a prayer of humility. We see this prayer and it is a prayer of humility. Look at the, the, the first verse. Let me look at that verse 14. It says this, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. If you remember, last week we talked about humility a little bit, and Paul, you remember what Paul called himself uh, last week in our text as we were uh, teaching through that? He called himself the least of all the saints. That's in the same chapter, just a couple of verses before. This is Paul once again showing his humble spirit. I'm not going to re-preach what I preached last week. Let me just briefly say, if there was someone who had reason to boast, could it have been Paul? If there was someone who, if we were to take a poll in here and say, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the greatest Christian to ever walk the face of the earth? I guarantee you that if we took an anonymous poll, that the Apostle Paul would probably lead the charge on the greatest Christian, the greatest missionary to ever live. It would be the Apostle Paul. If anyone had reason to boast, it would have been Paul. And Paul, over and over and over and over again, he shows us his humility. We won't cross-reference it again this week, but last week we went back to Philippians chapter 2, where Paul spoke about the mind of Christ, and that mind of Christ comes, it's a humble mind. The language in this text this morning of bowing the knee, I, I bow my knee, just that act, just that, that text, just that wording lends itself to showing humility. If you, if you came to my house and I invited you over for dinner and you came to the door and when I opened the door I saw you there and I immediately got to my knee, you probably think I'm crazy first of all, but it would be a showing of humility. Especially in these times, as someone of great honor would come into the room, people would fall to their knees. It's just a symbol of humility, and Paul was, uh, was, was showing this. He was, he was pinning this uh, to this church to let them know that Paul, the great apostle, the great church planner, the great missionary, would bow his knee in humility. If royalty came in the room this morning... And, and the appropriate response was to bow a knee. You know what we're saying? We are saying we know who we are. And we know who, who you are. I know who I am. And I know who you are. So I'm going to humbly bow my knee. I'm going to humbly bow my knee. And so Paul, as he just said in the previous verses, he is the least of all the saints. Paul's acknowledging who he is. And Paul is bowing his knee. And he is saying, I am bowing my knee to the one who this text says, the whole family in heaven and earth is named from him. Do you understand the humility that he is showing? Paul is saying, I'm the least of all the saints. You are the one from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. A humble spirit. A humble spirit. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Humility. Humble, a humble spirit. I love the lyric in the song that we sang, that last song. When you fall, we fall on our knees. When you fall, we fall on 
our knees. And if you think about it, the act of prayer just in general, Paul, the fact that Paul was praying in this letter is an act of humility. What are you doing and what am I doing when we pray? We are acknowledging that we don't have the answers. We've got problems. We've got issues. And we are talking to someone who has all power to do something about our problems and our issues. Just the act of prayer in general is an act of humility. Of humility. And this morning we need a revival in our churches. We need a revival in our country. We need a revival in our, in our inner workings and in our relationships of a humble Spirit, You don't have it all under control. Unless you think you do have it all under control, God sends things in your lives to remind you that you don't have it under control. If you struggle being a control freak, I would say that God, you are on the top of God's list of humbling. What does the Bible tell us? It says to humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God. And I've often, the old preacher said it like this. Hey, if you don't humble yourself, I'm fully confident that God knows how to humble you. And that always taught me, hey, you know what? I'll humble myself. God, please, you don't need to. I don't want to go through that. I'll humble myself. Just as a practical thought this morning, if prayer, if bowing the knee in prayer is a sign of humility then what are you and I communicating to God when we don't pray? Hey, if prayer is a sign of humility, if, if bowing my knee before the Holy Father is a sign of humility, then what am I saying when I don't pray? You know what I'm saying when I don't pray? That I've got it under control. It's pride. It's arrogance. That is what we are saying when we refuse to pray. Paul had a humble spirit, a prayer of humility. Number one, number two, this morning, a prayer for inner strength. Look at verse 16, a prayer for inner strength. Verse 16 says that he would grant you, this is God the Father, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart's Through faith. He's not only praying with humility, but he is praying for the church, for the Christians, that they would have inner strength. A prayer for inner strength. That word dwell, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In this instance, it literally means to settle down in and to make your home. To settle down if I'm going to come dwell in your house. That doesn't mean I'm coming over for lunch and I'm going to go home. If I'm going to come dwell in your house, that means move the stuff out of that bedroom. You know, that one that you said you're going to have for guests and now it's just a junk room. Anybody with me? All right. That's going to be our guest room. And like a guest couldn't fit in there if they had had to right now. All right. Clear that thing out. Throw that stuff away. Donate that stuff. Anyway, if I said I'm coming to dwell, that means I'm going to stick around a little bit. That means I'm going to make my home there. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, inner strength. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 says it this way, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You see, so oftentimes we focus on being fit. We focus on being physically fit. Fit. You guys would never be able to tell this, but for the past month or so, I've been going to the gym. It is yet to start showing, but I have been going to the gym for the last month or so. The Lord is my witness and Tim Currington is my witness as well because I've been going uh, with him. But you know, so often we live in this visual society, correct? We live in this visual, visual society that says take care of yourself. And what you really mean by taking care of yourself is taking care of your physical flesh and body. But I think what our culture is starting to understand in mental health is when we say take care of yourself, we think a lot more of our inward person. We think a lot more of our spirit and our mind and our soul. And Paul here says, I'm going to pray for inner strength, a strong inward nature, a mature and consistent spirit. In fact, at the end of this letter in chapter 6, 
uh, in the book of Ephesians, Paul will introduce the armor of God. If you've been in church, you've heard of the armor of God. And Ephesians 6 verse 10 says it like this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You think Paul was saying, hey guys, go do a couple burpees. Go do some lifting. Go do some sit-ups. Go do some push-ups. you got to be strong in the Lord. Because when they come, you got to physically... No. That's not what he was saying. Does he say we need to, does, was he telling the Ephesian Christians like, hey, we got some, something new is called P90X and we need you to take care of it because you need to be strong in the Lord. We got this other thing that's called insanity. That's true. That's what it is. All right. It's insanity. We need you to do that. Was Paul saying, hey, we need you to be physically fit and strong in the Lord? No. I think we all understand that Paul wanted them to be aware that they're not wrestling against flesh and blood, the outward. No, they were wrestling with spiritual wickedness. They were wrestling on the spiritual side. And Paul is praying that this church would be strong internally, strong in their spirit, strong in their mind. Church, we must be strong in our spirit this morning. We must be spiritually in shape. We must be spiritually fit. Because we will encounter many, many, many hurdles along the way in our Christian life. God never promised us an easy, cushy life as Christians. And Paul is praying that these Christians here in the church at Ephesus, the churches at Ephesus, that they would be strong in their spirit. Listen, we need a church full of people that are spiritually strong. Hey, they're not wavered and they're not blown to and, to and fro by every little wave that comes along. Hey, when something bad happens, they don't just completely fall off. No, we, we, need, we need Christians that are strong inwardly, strong in their spirit. I hope you want that for yourself. I, I hope, and all of us have different uh, makeups about us emotionally, but I hope that all of our lives, you know, they look like this, correct? And we've talked about hills and valleys throughout the existence of our church. We, but our life looks like this. But you know what? I pray that God would grant me, I pray that God would grant me a little bit more of this instead. And then that over time, He'd grant me a little bit more of this. And that over time, He'd grant me a little bit more of this. You know what that is? It's called being strong. In your inner man. That's called being strong in your spirit. And the things that used to rattle you and the things used to rock your universe, they happen now and you're steady. Hey, those things that are, were said to you at work or those, those things that your, the family members that you're about to see, you know, coming up on the holidays and, and, you know, he said this and I hadn't spoken to him in X amount of months, which is very unchristian, but I haven't spoken to him in X amount of months. I'm going to see him again. Oh man, I, the things that used to get under your skin, they no longer get under your skin because you're strong in your spirit because you're strong in the inner man. And we need a group of people that are strong on the inside. That Satan can't get to and won't get to. Paul prays. He prays a prayer of humility and he prays for inner strength for these Christians in Ephesus. If you don't get anything else from the sermon today, I hope you get that your inner spirit, your spiritual inner man, the power that he has with the Holy Spirit is of utmost importance. It's, it's more important than anything you can do physically. It's more important than anything is to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. So you can physically beat people and know so you can spiritually overcome. It's extremely important. But Paul didn't stop his prayer there. Remember context. Paul's in prison. Paul's writing this letter to churches in the town of Ephesus. He's told them theological truths. He has shown us humility in bowing his knee. He has prayed for their inner strength. And now he says this, number three, a prayer for a heart of love. A heart of love. Look at verse 17. Just taking the next verse. That Christ may may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width of and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness 
of God. Church, I don't know what that last statement means. I wish I could theologically break down what being filled with all the fullness of God means. I can't break that down. I can't tell you exactly what that means. Here's what I can tell you. Whatever it is, that's what I want. I don't know what being filled with all the fullness of God truly means, but whatever it does mean, I want it. I want that. And let's look at what Paul walks through in these two verses. We once again see the focus on the internal. We are to be rooted, that's below the surface, and grounded, that is the surface, in love. He wants us to be rooted and grounded in love. That means that we should have a foundation. We should have an internal base that is made up of love. An internal base made up of love. And Paul, I love what he does here. He tells them that he wants them to be rooted in love, but he tells them how he wants that to happen. And how he wants that to happen or how that is going to happen is for the Ephesian believers to begin to comprehend the love that God has for them. You see, you cannot be rooted in love yourself if you don't understand that God is love. He is the ultimate initiator in love, and he is the one who begins that in you. Hey, we love Him because He first loved us. He is the great initiator in this love. For God so loved the world that He gave, He took the step. God so loved the world that He stayed. No, God so loved the world that He gave. He took the first step. And Paul says this, you need to be rooted and grounded in love. And how you're going to do that is to understand, to comprehend, to seek, to know, to grasp the unfathomable, true, holy, perfect love that God has for each of us, for you and for me. You see, you cannot live a life of love if you are not living in the love that God has for you. You can't, here's a theme, you cannot live a life of love horizontally until you have comprehended the love that has come down to you from God Almighty. What's the problem in our culture, Josh? Why does everything seem to get it's postmodern, uh, post-Christian? We're, we're, we're in this weird segment of our, of our society and culture right now. Maybe it's because we're trying to love without comprehending love. Maybe it's because we're, we're so focused on the external, the relationships, the lovey, the lovey, lovey, lovey. We're so you know, into the, the romantic movies. We're so into the chick flicks. And my wife's into them. And I watch them every now and then. I've seen the notebook. It's all good. I may have cried. You'll never know. I'm all for that. But you know what? We've become mass. We've become experts at marketing love. And we have become ignorant of experiencing love. Why would this young boy or this young girl take off and, and forsake all their family and everyone that loves them and, and, and take off into this, this life of sin and this life of, of doing whatever they want to do and debauchery? Why would they do that? I don't know the real answer maybe. I don't know the details, but I can tell you this. It probably has something to do with looking for love and not comprehending love. It probably has something to do with that. Hey, why would this, this husband who's been married uh, to, to a loving and caring wife for, for many years, for, for decades even, why would a, a loving husband, a, a good man, why would that man turn his back on his wife and go seek love in, in other places? Why would he do that? Because maybe at some time he was looking for love and giving love and not comprehending love. You see, what we must be rooted and grounded in love. And that comes from comprehending, understanding, grasping the love that God has for each one of us. Let me say this, no matter where you are in your life, 
Christian. Unbeliever, no matter what you believe this morning about God, if you are not in a relationship with Him this morning, unbeliever, Christian, it doesn't matter. He loves you. He loves you. You mean me with my... You, you mean, I don't think you understand. I've done this, this. He loves you. But I don't understand how he loves you. You see, we can say that we understand eternal, everlasting love. We can say that all we want. And we can make statements, and I believe it comes from a pure heart, like there's nothing that my kids or my spouse or this person could ever do to make me stop loving them. We can say that. But I think if we're all really I mean, we could probably dream up the craziest scenario that someone could do to us that could probably help us to not love them anymore. Can we be real? I mean, I don't want to even start like thinking them out because they're pretty messed up, but we could come up with some, some crazy scenarios that we could say, okay, I loved that person with my true heart. I really did. However, I mean, enough was enough. And at some point in time, I think we are honest about that. You know what? Eternal, everlasting love. As Jesus was dying on the cross, the soldiers that were spitting on him on his way there. Those that when he said, I thirst, gave him vinegar. Those who put a crown of thorns on his head. Those who took the cat of nine tails, a whip with glass and and, and stones on the end of it and, and wrapped that around his body and ripped it back off. And he said, Father, forgive them. I don't think we understand just how much he loves us. You see, this morning you can't do anything bad enough. You can't go far enough away. You can't reject him enough for him to stop loving you. In fact, he doesn't love you as a result of something that you have done or that you have not done because you can't earn God's love. In fact, he does not love you this morning as a result of any accomplishments that you may have to your name because you don't deserve the love of God and neither do I. God doesn't love you because he needs you. You can't demand God love you. He already loves you. God loves you simply because God is love. God is love. Love. Love is not just what God does. Love is who God is. It's who He is. It is in His very character and His very nature. And Paul is speaking to the Christians at Ephesus. I love this. He's speaking to Christians. I believe this is very applicable to those that are unbelievers. But he's speaking to the church. And saying, hey, saved person. Hey, Sunday school teacher. Hey, kids ministry volunteer. Hey, worship team member. Hey, pastor. Hey, uh, lifelong church member. If you're a lifelong church member at Keystone, that means you're like one year old. So that's cool. But lifelong church member. You need to remember. You need to, you need to comprehend. You need to continue to try to figure this out. Just how much God loves you. Because he does. Because he does. And Jesus loves me. This I know is not just a song for your little bitty kids to sing when they're two or three years old. It is for the adult to comprehend and to continue to focus on. Why? Why do we need to do that? Because we need to be rooted and grounded in love. Because when we go to work tomorrow, we need to be rooted and grounded in love. Hey, when, when you got a Thanksgiving party at your, at your work this week and something goes wrong, you need to be rooted and grounded in love. Hey, when the person that was supposed to bring the turkey you know, doesn't show up, you need to be rooted and grounded in love. Hey, when, when, when you thought you had the day off and your boss says you got to come in, because you need to be rooted and grounded in love. Hey, when your kids are out of school and they're driving you crazy this week, you need to be rooted and grounded in love. 
Hey, when you're getting together with family and their kids are driving you crazy this week, you need to be rooted and grounded in love. Hey, when you get home this afternoon and your husband says that thing to you that you wish you wouldn't say, you need to be rooted and grounded in love. When you get home and, and your wife disappoints you in whatever way, you need to be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. Understanding the vertical, comprehending the vertical so that we can live in the horizontal. It's the cross. We'll close with this this morning, and I mean it. I'm not just being a preacher. We see a prayer of humility, a prayer for inner strength, a prayer for a heart of love. And then lastly, we see a prayer of focus. A prayer of focus. Hey, Paul, how are we going to end this thing? This is the the end of Ephesians part one. How are you going to end this thing? I love how we quote this verse, and we just quote verse 20. It's not even a sentence. So uh, the actual subject and verb in this, by the way, I'm a grammar person. If y'all aren't, that's all good. Verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant, ab- abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. That is a dependent clause. All right, come on now. Some of y'all are like starting to twitch. You're like, stop talking about grammar. That's a dependent clause. I mean, that, that clause on its own does not stand. That is not a sentence. That's not a statement. Like I appreciate like people putting that on pillows and stuff and like putting that on a sign in their, in their house. I appreciate all that. Make sure there's like a dot, dot, dot at the end of it though because there's more to that. Here is the purpose of that statement. Are you ready? It's, it's in verse 21. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Y'all don't know how bad I wanted to sing that. But the truth is this, Paul Paul has talked about many different things in these first three chapters. I won't go through them. There are many elements of this letter that we need to study probably a little bit deeper, those first three chapters. There are some things that we preached about that maybe you need to personally go back through and read these three chapters and think, man, I really want to understand this. So Paul, how are we going to end this? What should we focus on, Paul? Should we focus on, you know, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14? Or should we focus on chapter 2, the first five verses? Or what should we focus on, Paul? And Paul says this, that we should focus on giving glory to the one. We should focus on giving glory to God. Why? Here's where the dependent clause comes in. We are to focus on giving glory to the one who can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To Him be the glory. To Him be the glory. I feel like sometimes we take verse 20 and you know the part of the verse that screams to us? Above all that we ask or think. God, you can do even more than I'm about to ask you to do. God, I want that car. I want financial stability. I want this relationship to work out. And God, you're going to do not only that, but you're going to do even more than what I ask. No, the point of, this, of these two verses is to Him be the glory. And yes, He can do whatever He wants. Exceedingly, exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever think about. But it's to him be the glory in the church. The truth is we serve a great God with all power. And we need to live for his glory. Because this life is not about bringing you and me glory. It's about bringing God glory this morning. And it's just awesome that when we bring him glory that, oh, by the way, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or that we could think. Please don't turn that, that verse into a self-serving, uh, I don't know, I guess that's a name it and claim it, right? Don't turn it into that. God is not your ATM dispenser. God is not your credit card. It's my money and I want it now, right? That's not God. He's the one who gets the glory. 
He's the one. Hey, by the way, when someone asks about our church, and, and I have people, I don't know, maybe you have people that ask about, about our church, and I know I have friends across the country and locally that ask about our church, how's it going? Be very careful in how you respond. To Him be the glory in the church. To Him be glory in the church. Whatever God is doing here, and I don't even know what it is, but whatever He is doing in our church, to Him be the glory. Hey, are there people this morning, uh, there are many adults this morning that are not able to sit in this room that are this morning serving in our Keystone Kids. And man, they're doing a great job. Is it because of them? Well, I mean, sure, God uses people, and I'm thankful that He uses people. But it's to Him be glory in the church. But this morning, I mean, we had several people up here playing instruments, and we had vocalists, we have some people doing both, and man, isn't it because of Oh, that's great. God is using people, and I'm so thankful for that. But it's to Him be glory in the church. But Pastor Josh, thank you so much for preaching that sermon this morning. Man, I really needed to hear that sermon. No, it's to Him be glory in the church. I've tried to make it a habit. I don't want to come across as that, like, uh, trying to, like, throw it back in someone's face. But if someone ever gives me a compliment, I always say, hey, thank you so much, but praise the Lord. I really appreciate that, but man, praise the Lord. And I don't mean that. I'm not trying to get you, I'm not trying to get out of the conversation. I, I really mean to him be glory in this church. Hey, the day, the moment that the glory in this church is sought by me, you need to find another church. The moment that someone else is seeking glory in this church, they need to be dealt with. Hey, the moment that you care about glory in this church, you need to find somewhere else to take the false Christianity to. And so do I. And as your pastor, if you ever see me taking the glory in this church, I need some people that love me enough to call me on it. Can we be real? Can we be real? Hey, it's to Him be glory. The God this morning who can do anything... The God this morning that we believe, according to Scripture, spoke this earth into existence. That God loves you with an eternal, everlasting love. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. You can't. He loves you no matter what. Christian, you need to to remember that. You need to preach that to yourself. You need to get up and tell yourself that in the morning. If you're here today and you've never accepted that love, if you've never experienced that love that only Jesus can give, I want you to understand this morning that when he said, for God so loved the world, that he also meant you. I need you to understand this morning that when, when you hear of the love of God, God is love, that that means God loves you. God loves you. And before you can love others, before you can show love and be rooted and grounded in love, you must accept the greatest act of love that has ever happened on the face of this earth. And that is that roughly 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was born to a virgin. Miracle birth. Never has happened before. Never will happen again. I don't care what scientists try to do nowadays. Never, never has happened. Never will happen. A virgin giving birth to Jesus Christ. He lived a sinless life. You ever tried to live a sinless day? Good luck. He lived a sinless life. He was tempted just like you're tempted, just like I am tempted. He was tempted just like you are, and yet he did not sin. This is the way I say it. He lived the life that you couldn't live. He lived the life that I couldn't live. And you know what he did? The Bible says this, the wages of sin is death. Because I'm a sinner, I deserve death. You know what Jesus did? He lived the life that I couldn't live. And you know what he did? He died the death that I deserve to die. Hey, that cross that Jesus died on could, should have had my name, Joshua Scott Cox, on that cross. That should have been me. And you know what he did? He died that death for me. He paid sin's penalty on the cross for me. You know what he did? He was then buried, and three days later, he rose again. Did he rise for some amazing celebration? No, in fact, no one was around when he rose. Even his 12, 11 at that point, closest disciples weren't even there to see it. There was a lonely resurrection. But he rose again, what for? To show that he has the power over death. 
He has the power over sin. And he offers you an amazing gift. And that gift this morning is eternal life. That gift is knowing this morning that the day that you leave this earth to be absent from the body here on this earth is to be present with the Lord. He offers you eternal life with him in heaven, but he doesn't just offer you that. Oh no, we sung about it this morning. The last two songs, he offers you his Holy Spirit. That is God who comes and dwells in your heart and dwells in your life. He can change your life today. I think we have a lot of people that live thinking, man, I can't wait to get to heaven one day. I like to be around people that go, man, heaven came down and glory filled my soul and the Holy Spirit lives with me right now. Yeah, I'm ready for heaven, but I love what God's doing in my heart right now. He can do that for you. I'm asking you a simple question today. Would you surrender to the love that God has for you?